So Sam, tell me about the beginning of the Bangladesh war. The Mukti Bahini. Oh. Usual political sense. Uh, Pakistan had really cracked down in a big way. The poor old Bengalis, what could they do against uh, the Pathans and Punjabi Muslims? And the army. Uh, so they started pouring it into India. A humanitarian crisis, a war, and the birth of a nation, Bangladesh. In April 1971, millions of refugees from East Pakistan began pouring into India when Pakistan's military ruler, General Yahya Khan, cracked down on the Bengali population. He was hoping to suppress their demand for autonomy. Situation created by the Indian aggression is leading the two countries to a point of no return. The sole bond of religion was not strong enough to hold this population of 75 million under the yoke of Pakistan any longer. Under the leadership of their popular leader, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, they demanded an equal and rightful share in governance of their own country. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was greatly disturbed by this influx of almost 10 million refugees whom India was in no position to accommodate. She felt the solution lay in going to war with Pakistan and summoned General Manik Shah, Chief of Army Staff since 1969. And Mrs. Gandhi, in an awful temper, looked at me and read out messages from the Chief Minister of West Bengal. The thousands of refugees have poured in. From the Chief Minister of Assam, the Chief Minister of Tripura. And she looked at me and said, what are you doing about it? Nothing, what's it got to do with me? She said, I want you to do something. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, I want you to march into East Pakistan. I said, that means war. So she said, I don't mind if it's war. So I said, oh, have you read the Bible? God said, let there be light, and there was light. And you say, let there be war, and there war? Are you ready? I certainly am not. Then I said, this was about, about 23rd of April. I said, you know, the Himalayan Pass is a opening. And if the Chinese give us an ultimatum, then I said, the monsoon will be breaking in a few days' time. And when it rains in that part of the world, it pours. Rivers become like oceans. If you stand on one bank, you can't see the other. My movement will be confined to roads. Because of climatic conditions, the Air Force will not be able to support me. And if I were to go in, I guarantee you a 100% defeat. I said to Mrs. Gandhi, will you now give me your orders? All right, cabinet would meet again at four o'clock. So everybody started walking out, I being the junior one. A smile on my face as I was going out. She said, Chief, stay behind. So I said, Prime Minister, before you open your mouth, shall I send in my resignation on grounds of health, mental or physical? And she said, oh, sit down, Sam, tell me. Everything you told me is the truth? I said, yes, everything I've told you is the truth. I said, it's my job to fight, fight to win, not to lose. And she smiled at me, she said, all right, Sam, you let me know when you're ready. By December, the tension between India and Pakistan was at its height. Bangladesh's freedom fighters, the Mukti Bahini, were bravely resisting the Pakistani onslaught. The war finally began on the 3rd of December 1971 after Pakistan attacked several Indian airfields. Strategic military planning ensured excellent coordination between the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. 
India did not have to fight any foreign ally of Pakistan, neither China nor the United States of America, both of whom could have been very dangerous. The war, which lasted 13 days, ended on the 16th of December, with the surrender by Lieutenant General A.K. Niazi to General Officer Commanding-in-Chief Eastern Command, Lieutenant General Jagjit Singh Arora. India had captured nearly 5,000 square miles of Pakistani territory, and 93,000 Pakistani troops had surrendered. Bangladesh became the first nation to be born after the Second World War. Indira Gandhi's rule as Prime Minister had reached its peak. This was perhaps an ideal time to once and for all put an end to the Kashmir dispute. Unfortunately, the post-71 war talks at Simla between the two countries could not achieve this, and the state continues to be an issue of controversy. So what went wrong at Shimla? She went there and Bhutto made a complete of her. I know I've just taken over from Yahya Khan. If I yield anything just now, they'll throw me out. Give me a chance. In six months' time, I promise you, everything, we'll settle everything peacefully. She came back and she told me, I said, he's made a monkey out of you. Meanwhile, Sam ensured humane and comfortable treatment of the 93,000 prisoners of war for as long as they were in Indian custody. He also ensured special care for women prisoners of war. Both he and his wife, Sillu, worked hard to ensure the rights and welfare of war widows. I went to Pakistan about two months after the conflict. And they really gave me a first-class welcome. Uh, the governor, this was at Lahore, the governor invited me for lunch, gave me a martini before lunch, wines at lunch, and during lunch he said, General, can you, will you do me a favor? So I said, if I can, Mr. Governor, I will. I thought he was going to be asking me about some relation of it. He said, my staff is outside. They want to shake hands with you. I went out, and there they were all lined up. About the 11th man took his pagri off and put it at my feet. So I picked it up. They gave it to my yeki wapne kia. Kata hazur, aap the to hum bach gaye. Mere paanch ladke aapke kaidi hai. Unki chitti aati hai. Kya aapne sabko Quran Sharif di? Wo log barak mein sote hain, aapke jawan bahar sote hain. वो लोग चारपाई पे सोते हैं आपके जवान जमीन पे सोते हैं आप जब जाते हैं हाथ मिलाते हैं सबके साथ लंगर में जाके खाना टेस्ट करते हैं एंड टर्न राउंड द गवर्नर वाज विद मी अब हम कभी नहीं मानेंगे साहब के हिंदू खराब है एंड आई गॉट इनटू ट्रबल इन माय ओन कंट्री द ब्यूरोक्रेट्स एंड द मिनिस्टर्स कंप्लेंड अबाउट मी कि चीफ साहब तो उनको ऐसा रखते हैं कि जैसे उनके जवाई हैं अजीब थे वो मेरे सन जिल्लो दे कंप्लेन अगेंस्ट मी कैबिनेट मीटिंग एट मीट मिस गांधी लुक्ड इट मी आई सेड प्राइम मिनिस्टर दे वर सोल्जर्स दे फोर्ट दे फोर्ट एक्सट्रीमली वेल दे लॉस्ट आई एम लुकिंग आफ्टर द सोल्जर्स नो आई फ Soon after the war, General Manik Shah was awarded the Padma Vibhushan for his exemplary contribution to the nation. On 1st of January 1973, he was made India's first Field Marshal, a rank that is held for life. He therefore continues to be the senior most officer of the Indian Army. What was your greatest achievement in the Army? Do you do? From the rank of second lieutenant to field marshal, I have never punished a man. My adjutant general, when I was the chief, and my judge advocate general used to get, oh, wild. Court martial proceedings would come to me. If they said not guilty, I'd sign. 
if she said guilty and punished, I take the file home, I look at it, I say, no, I think witness number three has lied with the so and so thing. And they say, sir, how can we maintain discipline with you as the army chief, you not punish? I say, you damn chaps, sit, sit in Delhi with your wives and your children in lovely homes, and you forget what those chaps are going through. About a year after the Bangladesh war, um, I had come down from England and we'd, we went shopping for uh, just father and I buy, because I wanted to buy some cutlery and we, were, we happened to find ourselves in Connaught Circus and w somebody, I think uh, it was one of the shopkeepers where we went inside, recognized my father. Next thing you knew us, he must have phoned up his friends or he mu the grapevine, whatever it was. But the whole area where we were, every shopkeeper was out. Every shopkeeper had something to say, came and talked to him. Uh, somebody wanted to touch his feet, somebody wanted to give him a present, somebody had some story to tell. And it was amazing how much affection and respect he commanded at that time. I couldn't go anywhere. When people would ask, when I, General, when are you taking over? One evening, at four o'clock, in my office, I was having tea when Mrs. Gandhi rang up. She was in Parliament House. Uh, and she rang up and said, Sam, are you very busy? And I said, Prime Minister, the Army Chief is always busy, but never too busy to talk to his Prime Minister. She said, can you come over? And I said, I'm having tea here. She said, oh, I'll give you tea. I said, I have good tea here. You'll give me muck. She said, oh, come over. So I said, okay. So I got hold of the ADC. I said, the girl wants me. Come on, get the car. The girl wants me. Uh, I was, you always knew I'd talk like that. So we got into the car, went to Parliament House. She was sitting in her office in a kidney-shaped table. She was an actress, she was sitting down like this. I walked in in my breezy way. I said, hello, Prime Minister. You seem worried. What's wrong? She said, I've got problems. So I said, oh, cry on my shoulder. What are your problems? And she looked me straight in the face and said, you are my problem. So I said, now what have I done? Have I made a speech? Have I done something stupid? So I said, what have I done now? She said, Everybody says you are going to take over from me. So I said, and what do you think? She says, you can't. And I said, oh, you think I'm so incompetent? I didn't mean that, Sam. You wouldn't. She has a long nose. I have a longer one. I put my nose next to her. I, I want to tell you, I have no intention or even a thought of getting involved in politics or taking over, as long as I command my army without interference. Okay, you have told you enough about Mrs. Gandhi and myself. Moraji Desai. Ah, you want to know about Moraji Bai. You've been dying to tell that story, haven't you? I've got two or three stories about Moraji Bai. When I became army chief, Muraji Bai was the finance minister in Mrs. Indra Gandhi's cabinet. Yes. Then he became prime minister. Mrs. Gandhi lost the election, he became prime minister. One day he said, I believe you drink. So I said, yes, I have it. You mustn't drink. Be bad for you. So I said, prime minister. I come to my prime minister, he said, you mustn't drink. I go to a party and I talk to a pretty girl. My wife says, you mustn't talk to her. I'm a field master, is life worth living? He says, your wife is quite right. Jinx and pretty girls will ruin you. I said, they haven't ruined me so far. <laughs> Sam, what's your reading? Some muck, as usual. Look what I found from Bombay. What? I found this in Bombay at Serubai's house. What? What's this you found? It's a photo of your entire family in Amritsar. Good God. I can... 
I even recognize myself. How old were you then? Where did you find it? Serubai has it. Has a whole bunch of them with her. So? So what I recognize myself there. A good looking chap. I know. <laughs> I wanted to know a little bit more about your childhood in Amritsar. My father was a doctor. Our ancestor, his ancestral home was Balsar. Uh, he became a doctor in Bombay at a very young age. Then he met my mother and he got married, but he couldn't earn a living in Bombay. So they said, Dr. Manik shall go to the Punjab. Now this is 1899 or 1900, those people in Bombay didn't know where Punjab was. The fifth of six children, Sam was born into a Parsi family in 1914 in Amritsar. His father was one of the few practicing physicians in the city at the time and remained in Amritsar till partition. Were you a very religious family? We taught our prayers and we said our prayers. I in fact, I say the same prayers now that I used to when my mother taught me when I was a little chap. Every night. Every night. In bed before going to sleep. We had a wonderful childhood. We used to... There were five of us because my eldest brother Fali was in Bombay and my father sent us all off to boarding schools. My el elder brother John went to Sherwood. I went to Sherwood. Jimmy went to Sherwood. My two sisters, Silla and Seru, they were sent to the convent in Murray. And we went for nine months. We come back in December. You know, Sherwood has produced two excellent people. One field marshal and one Amitabh Bachchan. That's right. But Amitabh came much after me. Sam, tell me about your first girlfriend. Oh, first girlfriend, God. That was in Sherwood. We used to, uh, we had a uh, girls' school, All Saints. There. Yeah. I mustn't give you her name either. <laughs> we used to go at night, uh, and they'd come out from the from the dormitory through the lavatory, etc. We'd all meet there. No, stupid chaps, you know. Did watching your father work as a doctor give you ideas of what you wanted to do with your I life? wanted to become a doctor myself. How strong was that desire? Very strong. My father had promised to send me. He sent my two elder brothers, Pali and John, to England, and what? they became engineers. And he promised to send me to England too, if I did well in my senior Cambridge. So when my results came for the senior Cambridge, I'd done extremely well. I passed out top in the, the school. I'd got eight subjects. I'd got distinguished in eight subjects. And I came to my father. I couldn't do any better. So he promised to send me to England. And he said, my son, I promised, I promise, I'll keep my promise. But you're only 15. Join college here. And when you're 18, I'll send you. And I was so stupid, I didn't talk to my father for 18 months. And I read in the papers that there was an army examination. So I got money from my mama. I went to Delhi, appeared for it, and I got to the army. In 1932, Sam joined the first batch of the Indian Military Academy, Dehradun, as a gentleman cadet. He went on to study at the Staff College, Quetta, and still later to the Imperial Defence College in the United... My first confidential report was... This officer, Dash, I beg his pardon, Dash, may someday become an officer. You, you know, those days, every officer who joined the Indian Army, British or Indian, had to do one year with a British regiment. So I did my first year with the Royal Scots. That's right. And uh, they couldn't, uh, the jocks couldn't, couldn't pronounce my name. They used to call me Mr. McIntosh. <laughs> During World War II, Sam fought as an officer of the Frontier Force Regiment under General Slim. While defending the bridge over the river Sitang in Burma, 
he was severely wounded by Japanese troops. Recognizing his courage and fearing he would not survive, Major General Sir Richard Covens removed his own military cross and presented it to Sam as an immediate award for gallantry in the field. I was a major. Japanese trashed the life out of us. Jap put a whole burst of Tommy gun into my stomach. Nobody thought I'd ever. 36 hours after I was wounded, and uh, I was like there mourning, blood coming out of my mouth and from everywhere else. And uh, my Batman, Mayor Singh, got hold of the surgeon, Australian surgeon, said, my saab is wounded. So he said, when was he wounded? He said, yesterday, where was he wounded? In the stomach. He said, oh, can't waste my time over him because, you know, abdominal injuries and this you deal with them straight away. But Mayor Singh said, no, my saab is still there. Been. So he brought him to me. The fellow looked at me and said, what happened to you? Young chap. By that time I had regained consciousness. I said a bloody mule kicked me. <laughs> so he said, Oh, you got a sense of humor. <laughs> Worth saving. So they operated on me in the hospital. After partition, I became director of military operations. And uh, I remained director of military operations for three and a half years. Uh, I was sent to Kashmir with VP Menon, who was the State Secretary. Uh, the Maharaja's army had, the Muslim element had revolted, the tribesmen had come in, and I was sent there with him, VP Menon, to see if he can get the accession from the Maharaja, meet, see what the military situation was like. And uh, at about midnight, the Maharaja signed, he kept on saying, we must send soldiers in. He said, we can't send soldiers into your state unless you accede to India. So at midnight, he acceded to India. VP Menon handed over the accession papers to Mountbatten. And Mountbatten looked at me. He said, Manakji. <laughs> he didn't call him Manakji. Manakji. What's the military situation like? It's very bad, sir. Uh, the tribes are busy looting and raping about nine kilometers away from Srinagar and the airfield. If they once get in, we've lost Kashmir because we won't be able to fly troops in, etc. So he looked at Nehru and Nehru talked and all until Sardar Patel lost his temper. He said, Jawaharlal, do you want Kashmir or do you want to hand it over? He said, of course, so Kashmir is ours now. So he said, will you issue orders? And before he could issue orders, Sardar Patel said, you have received your orders. So I walked out, walked out and we started flying troops into Kashmir. What was your relationship with Sardar Patel like? Sardar Patel was uh, home minister and I had a good relationship with him. Uh, every morning, VP Menon and I would go to his place and he would be sitting down there. His daughter, Bunny Ben, be sitting cross-legged with a Parker Fountain, a brown Parker Ben taking notes. And he would say, VP, I want Baroda, take him with you. I would go as the bogeyman in uniform. When the killings were taking place in Calcutta, by British commander in chief, he came along and said, Hey, you, the Sarda wants you in Calcutta. So I said, Why me, sir? He phoned, he wants you there. An aircraft has been laid on for you. So I went there. The Sardar was with the Chief Minister, B.C. Roy. When I went in there, he said, I don't want to 
arguments, etc. I'm going to ask you a question, I want an answer. If I hand over the situation to the army, how many Bengalis will you kill and how long will it take you? I was a very young brigadier. So I opened my mouth. I said, sir, about a hundred, about a month. So he said, turned around to Bidhan Roy, he said, thousands are being killed. He said, go and kill them, take over. And he deployed troops all over Calcutta. We didn't have to kill anybody. Uh, everything finished. He said, come here. Okay. And in Gujarati he tells me, Tame Satsu nahi bolo? So I said, what have I done? He said, Tame kai look, ki ek so Bengali na maasao ni ek mani, ek bhi nahi maario. Then he tells me, he said, well done, thank you. Sir of a senior officer or anything like that, Sam was very, very jolly chap. After being commandant of the infantry school Mao in 1955, Major General Manik Shah had become Commandant of the Defence Services Staff College Wellington, Nilgiris, in 1959. In 1961, there was an inquiry against General Manik Shah, instituted by the then Defence Minister, Krishna Menon. Sam was accused of being too anglicised, and statements allegedly made by him on various occasions in the past were collectively dug up and used as evidence. I was posted to the staff college. As commandant? As commandant. And they hatched up a plot against me. They had inquiries against me. And what were the charges against me? That I'm more British than Indian that I am a day to have said that I will have no instructor at the staff college whose wife looks like an ayah. How did react to all of this? We, we didn't bat an eyelid, we just carried on as if nothing had happened. Towards the end of the inquiry, China attacked India over a border dispute in October 1962. The attack took everyone, including Pandit Nehru, by surprise, and the Indian army, completely unprepared for a war, faced a debacle. Sam was sent to Tezpur as General Officer Commanding for Corps. Then the Chinese came into Nifa and General Call was sacked and Krishna Menon was removed and Nehru sent for me. He said, I've got a vigorous enemy. Will you go and take over? And I said, I've been waiting 18 months for this, Prime Minister. And he said, oh, that was all a mistake. That was all a mistake. Will you go? I said, yes, I'll go. So I took over the thing. And so I always say that the Chinese came to my rescue. If the Chinese hadn't come in, and if Krishna Menon and Kaul hadn't been sacked, I don't know what they would have done with me. I said, I don't want to know what happened in the past. All I want to know is, who are my commanders? Where are the Chinese? How much ammunition have I got? How much oil, petroleum and food have I got? I just leave the map to be here. Mr. did. After half an hour, I rang the bell. They came in. And I said, I don't know whether I'm doing right or wrong, but these are my orders. And that was the time when the chief of staff took his hat off, flung it on the ground, jumped on it. He said, thank effing God, some, at last somebody is giving orders. We have never had orders before. And my orders were that we start advancing. Uh, so where? Uh, no, So Sam? Tell me about when you joined the Gurkhas. Oh Lord. In the Indian Army, there were ten regiments of Gurkhas. So, when India got independence, like the Pakistan people went to Pakistan, certain regiments went to Her Majesty's Gurkhas, and certain regiments remained in India. But there was a treaty between 
the King of Nepal and the British government that all Gurkha regiments would be officered by British officers. So when the British officers left, there had to be some Indian officers. So I was the first Indian to be posted to a Gurkha regiment. I haven't been with the Frontier Force Regiment, now became a Gurkha. What year was this? 1947. 1947. And I met a Gurkha sentry, I looked at him and I said, asked him, your name Kechar. And he said, Harka Badr Guru. Then I looked at him, Mira Nam Kechar. And he thought and thought and he said, Sam Badr. <laughs> I became Sam Badr. <laughs> Sam Bahadur's bond with the Gurkhas continues even today. His Gurkha orderlies and their families settle with Sam and Silu in Kunur, where they continue to serve him faithfully. The underlying affection between them is apparent to all those who visit their home. Hey, Sam. After retiring as army chief, the field marshal created a new life for himself in the boardrooms of the corporate world. He was invited to join the boards of several top companies of the country and continues to actively help and advise them regularly. His ability to motivate people from all walks of life is perhaps one of his greatest assets. I'm going on the 29th of this month to Madras. From Madras I catch a flight to Calcutta. I have an annual meeting, annual general meeting of East India Hotel on the 30th. I come to Bombay on the 31st. How many companies are you on the board of now? Um, you, you're not allowed to be on the board of more than 14. And I'm on the boards of 14 companies and you're not allowed to be chairman of more than 10 companies, but I'm the chairman of six. Do you want to get up to 10? No, <laughs> I want to get out of some of them. Are there any companies that you particularly remember that you had a lot of problems with? Companies that maybe you had a hand in helping turn around or become profitable or become more efficient? I don't think so. In fact, I think quite a lot of them became less efficient. <laughs> the calm and constant presence in Sam's life was his wife, Silu. Her recent loss has left a deep void in his existence. She had always acted as a balancing force in Sam's hectic life. A talented artist, Silu was actively involved in the Army Wives Welfare Association, particularly during the Bangladesh War. After settling in Kunur, she played an instrumental role in taking forward a small medical clinic for the poor which is now well known throughout the Nilgiris. She donated the proceeds from the sale of her paintings for the clinic as well. Sudo. Sam, yeah. tell me, having been in, uh, born, uh, born in Amritsar, having lived all over India, why did you finally choose to settle in a place like Kunur? Funny. I used to be the commandant of the staff college and then after the Chinese, I was sent off to take over that defeated army. And Mama was here and she bought half acres of hillside for the princely sum of 18,500 rupees. Mama built this house? Mama got it built in. She designed it. So why don't you tell me why we call this place Stavka? Oh, that's very simple. Stavka, if you read War and Peace, is the headquarters of the highest military commander in the land. And I didn't know what to call it. 
uh, until my daughter Sherry, who is educated, said, Father, why are you even thinking? You must call it Stavka. I said, why Stavka? And she told me. Have you read War and Peace? No. <laughs> what all do you do in terms of Kunur and its community? Very little. When Sidhu was living, we'd go out. He'd arrange things, he'd go out. After she said, I keep to myself mostly. But you should go out and socialize some. Nobody likes mixing with a field marshal. Oh, come on. <laughs> Tell me more about Silu. What did she do in the army as an army wife? Oh, she did a lot. She did all the army wives' welfare funds and all that sort of thing. She was very good that way. She did a lot of philanthropic work here also. Yes, she ran that, started that clinic, and she did that. She, she's very good about all those things. Anyway, why do you keep on asking me about my, my wife? Because, okay, one final question. What? Then I'll leave you to it. Yeah. Couple, actually two final questions. Two now, go on. Yes, yes. One. What? Looking at your life as a military general, having all that power at your command. Uh, are you happy with the way things went? Was there anything you would have liked to have done differently in your entire career as a general, as a soldier? No, I was quite happy. And how about your personal life? I had a very pleasant personal life. I had my two daughters, I had my grandchildren, I had my wife, I had my Gurkhas, quite happy. Do you like your grandchildren? Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Come. Now where are you taking? We're just going to the edge of the balcony. And that we're going to plant here tomorrow. Tell Finn.